uh, let's start. And um, as last week we looked at Luke, five themes in Luke, uh, if you were there and you've got the notes, I thought the obvious follow-on this week was to look at five themes in Acts. And in a moment, just got to make sure I've got the right notes page up in front of me. That's because they're the same author. They're two, they're two parts of the same overarching narrative. Uh, and so it makes sense to deal with them together. Uh, the clearest space where you see that is in the dedication right at the beginning. So Luke chapter 1 verse 3 is I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent, Theophilus. And Acts chapter 1 verse 1 in the first book, which refers to the book that we call the Gospel of Luke, I should say, nowhere do we get Luke internally naming himself. Uh, so that's a church tradition. Uh, Luke doesn't actually, in the Gospel of Luke, doesn't say this was written by Luke. Um, and neither does Acts, but there's a lot of clues in there. So in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning. So we, you, you see that, that, you know, it's like a book two of a duology. Uh, and because of that, a lot of the themes continue through. And the first theme that I wanted to uh, remind, remind, is the salvation history geography theme. So if you recall, uh, in Luke's gospel, the salvation history sees everything up to Jesus, including even John the Baptist, as sort of the prophetic time, the work of we might say God the Father. I'm not a fan of that because every act of the Trinity is an act of every part of the Trinity. Um, but we would kind of focus perhaps on, on you know, the, the kind of the creative act of God and those sorts of things. So that's John. In Jesus, we have a, a second act in salvation history. We have his teaching, his death and his resurrection. And then in, in the third act of salvation history, we've got the age of the Holy Spirit. We've got sometimes referred to as the epoch of the Holy Spirit, if you like kind of the old fashioned language. And uh, that is a bit fuzzy. You know, where does that start? Does it start with Pentecost? Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, so, so this is... And what this is, is it's, it's essentially the age in which we are responding to the work of God in, the, the, in Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's pretty consistent with the themes from last week. And we get that same kind of geographical and theological uh, operation. So Old Testament is primarily focused around the geography and the nationhood of Israel. Then it narrows into the crucifixion in Jerusalem, which is the theological center point of the universe. And then it spreads out, in essence, into the world or, or the Gentile world or the Roman world. Depends on how you kind of want to massage that phrase. But you get this three parts with three geographies uh, and three acts of God. So just it's always useful to keep that in your mind especially when you're reading Acts, to, to be aware that, in a sense, we're, we're, we're working with, the, with what happens next after Jesus. And I mean, that, that makes sense, obviously, in an historical context. Um, and like Luke, this is history as theology. So it's, it's not a systematic theology. It's, a, it's an explanation of that history. It's also an explanation as to why the church that starts off so very Jewish, Jesus is Jewish, his early disciples are all Jewish, even Paul is Jewish, becomes such a strongly Gentile uh, religious response. It, it's very much Gentile church by, by the time that, 
Luke's gospel is written, well, not exclusively, but it's got a strong Gentile flavor. Uh, and this is part of Luke explaining that. How do we become, how do we go from being a Jewish thing to a Gentile thing? Okay, so the next thing, the next thing, just kind of reminding you of that salvation history, um, is around the theme of the Holy Spirit. Although it's called the the book is called the Acts of the Apostles, uh, it wouldn't be unreasonable to propose renaming it and calling it the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the most dominant character in the Book of Acts, even more than Peter or Paul, who are the other two kind of major players. Um, I actually did a little, uh, on Bible Gateway, you can um, do a search for words. And I put in spirit. And I then just, everything in the New Testament. So there are 96 references uh, to Holy Spirit in the New Testament. 42 of those are in Acts. Almost half the references to the Holy Spirit are in Acts. And if you take... Luke and Acts together, you get more than half. Uh, so very clearly, we have the Holy Spirit as this very significant player. Uh, and in one sense, the first big move of the Holy Spirit is, of course, Pentecost. It's, um, you know, we all, we all know the story. Uh, the graphic there, just so you know, is actually from the artwork that, that we put up in the church at Pentecost. Excuse me. I'm just going to go like that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that artwork that is from the Holy is the Pentecost artwork that we put up. Um, and already we start to see this movement to, uh, towards the Gentile community because uh, we see in Pentecost that the Holy Spirit is poured out on all sorts of people from all around the world. Now, they're all in Jerusalem, so they're probably all, uh, they're probably, you know, we would think of them being as primarily uh, Greek-speaking Jews uh, or, or that kind of thing. Um, but all the way through the book of Acts, we see the Holy Spirit just being poured out abundantly on, um, on Gentiles. And uh, so, so that's part of the, that's the uh, theme, if you will, is just the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're reading Acts, um, it's kind of broken down into two parts. In that, it's it's got a sort of a focus on the work of Peter, and and the term there is sort of Petrine, um, to do with Peter. Uh, and, there, and, and, and when it's focused around the, the missionary work of Peter, it's geographically kind of focused on Jerusalem, moving in towards Antioch. It would be easy enough to, to make the assumption that under Peter, the church is very much Jewish focused. You know, it's based in Jerusalem. Peter's Jewish. Uh, we get this idea that he's very much kind of Jewish focused. But... Um, and it's not necessarily the case, because um, it's we're looking at this uh, the community transitioning from being a an almost an exclusively Jewish to a Gentile and Jewish mixed economy, if you will. Um, and so, under Peter's influence or, or leadership, uh, we get a, a number of things. So one, we get the the Holy Spirit coming. Uh, at Pentecost or, or Shavuot, um, and that's that's a, a very much uh, an open-ended invitation into the church to to to, to Gentiles as well as to Jews. Uh, we get seven deacons appointed. Now, now we're starting to also get some structuring in the church. We've got kind of so we've gone from this radical. Uh, community that just sort of were gathering and responding to Jesus in all sorts of different ways. And they're starting to, to put some structure in place. So and, under Peter, we start to get structure. Um, and it, yeah, um, and so we get the deacons appointed. 
Now, the deacons are appointed because in the heady sort of atmosphere of the first days of the church, it became clear to some of the early Christians that some widows and orphans were getting better treatment than other widows and orphans. And so uh, what you got was you got um, the appointment of seven deacons to make sure that all were receiving appropriately, including the, the Gentile, the, the, the Greek widows. Uh, and so, so that's a movement under Peter's leadership that looks beyond kind of that Jewish tradition. Uh, we also get the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, now, the Ethiopian eunuch is uh, a fascinating story uh, about the way the Holy Spirit moves around. That's with Philip, but it's under the Petron um, time, if you will. Uh, and we see the Holy Spirit deliberately interacting in such a way. And the story is told that the Holy Spirit creates the circumstance that brings not a Greek, not a Roman, not a Jew, but an Ethiopian, not a, not a man, but a eunuch. Now, a eunuch would have had other concerns in the Jewish tradition. Um, there, there were some concerns with whether or not a eunuch could be fully incorporated into the church, and, and many rabbis would have said no. And yet, the Ethiopian eunuch is baptized on the spot. Uh, and so we get this very powerful story there of the church kind of the boundaries of who's in and who's out is expanded. Uh, and then, of course, there's, you know, Peter's famous vision of the animals on the sheet and the sheet comes down uh, and, you know, Pete eats and Peter says, oh, no, Lord, I'm not going to eat that. It's unclean. And the sheet comes down and God says, eat it. And Peter says, no. And eventually God says, look, if I've said it's clean, it's clean. I'm paraphrasing, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and so what, what, what we're getting is we're getting this kind of continually expanding picture into the Gentile, the non-Jewish world. Um, and then in around chapter 13, uh, we get this transition to focusing on Paul's missionary activity. And Paul is gung-ho, he's all over the place. He's, he's, he goes off on three or four missionary activities. We have all his letters. Now, it's important to realize that Acts and Paul's letters don't match up exactly. But there's some fairly strong correlation. So it's, it's possible that, you know, uh, just it's kind of different ways of telling the story or those sorts of things. But just be aware. Be aware that there's, they don't, that there's not a one-to-one -one match. Interestingly, in, in Paul's missionary journeys, we get one of the clues that the author of Luke Acts is, in fact, Luke, because every now and then he talks about him, we rather than they. So he includes himself in, in some of those passages, and we have, recalling, we have recountings that that is uh, Luke. So a little internal clue, not a, not a silver bullet, not a slam dunk, but yeah, um, a clue. So during this period, we see a far stronger emphasis on the inclusion of the Gentiles. And we also start to see stronger and stronger signs that the church is splitting with the Jewish structure. Uh, and it's, it's just important to be aware of that, I suppose. Just you know, be aware that that's what's going on. Uh, one of the other questions is, in a sense, the minimum standard. What's the least you have to do to be a Christian? Do you have to be Jewish first? Do you have to be uh, circumcised? Uh, do you have to memorize Torah? What's the minimum standard? And then, so that's the conversation um, which was essentially settled at the Council of Jerusalem, uh, where Paul and Peter, and, and it, yeah, so that's part of the question. Okay. I feel like we're cracking along here, and I hope I hope it's not too much or too quick. Um, uh, the next, the next theme there is, I 
I don't know if it, I included it as a theme because I think it's an important thing for us to ponder on. But I, I almost wonder, and here's why. If you were to set a movie, um, or just watch a movie in kind of a modern day context, if you were to watch, um, I don't know, some political thriller uh, where, you know, people are trying to, I don't know, spy on the president. These are things you usually set in America. Or uh, you're watching some, you know, movie set in Europe, uh, you know, sort of in a buddy movie set in Europe or whatever. One of the things that's going to happen is that there's going to be transportation that happens uh, or doesn't happen. <laughs> Regardless, the, the, you, the presence of transportation is going to be a fairly consistent thing in any movie that's set these days. You know, I, I was thinking of, um, I think it was White House, White House Down, which is a sort of action thingy, you know, um, the White House is under attack by terrorists. And there's helicopters and there's tanks and there's there's a car and there's all these sorts of moments where transport is used. And so, in a, in a way, um, the relationship with authority structures operates in a similar sense in acts. And the reason I'm not sure if it should be uh, a theme, should be counted as a theme, is that it's, it's not dealt with. Uh, it's, it's in a sense, it's, it's, it's a background. It's, it's like um, cars are in the world today. They're not dealt with as a theme. They're just part of the reality. But in that sense, maybe it's also really important for us to be aware of this uh, contextually. You know, if we need to be aware that the reality in the time of Acts were, was marked by these various different power dynamics and power relationships. So I would suggest that there are essentially three main power dynamics described in Acts. Um, the first would be the early church and the Jewish non the non-christian the non-jesus following jews how's that and the reason i say that is in the very early church you were there were the jews who followed jesus and the jew and the jews who didn't follow jesus christian wasn't yet a thing um but uh you you kind of got this moment where like like i said very early in acts we actually get the first use of the word christian to denote um the non, you know, a, a separate identity from the early Jewish followers. I hope that made some sense. Anyway, so what you get is you get the, the power dynamic as the church starts to separate from the Jewish structure. And in one sense, in Paul, uh, in Paul, in Acts, uh, Paul's story is one of the kind of the easiest place to enter into that. Because Paul is a representative of the synagogues. He, and he is hellfire and brimstone before there was hellfire and brimstone preaching against the early Christians. And he's getting letters from the leaders of the synagogues to go to, you know, to different places to, you know, to, to make the argument that uh, we should be getting the Christians out, of, out and all the rest of it. Um, that's a pretty big thing. It would also include things like the martyrdom of Stephen, who's often considered to be the first Christian martyr. But it wasn't always bad. But remember that it's written at a time when this split is still pretty fresh and the psychological wounds are still pretty fresh. Then we have the Roman authorities. Now they've got a mixed portrayal in Acts and, and you know, maybe that's like we have with with governments in general, you know, um, as long as they're not too tyrannical, it, it's a pretty mixed bag. Um, so sometimes they're seen as the sort of the good guys. They rescue Paul from Jewish and Gentile rioters, Acts chapter seventeen and Acts chapter nineteen. So uh, yeah, that, that, that this time they're the good guys, but then they imprison Paul, and now they're the bad guys. Um, and, and look, I suppose in one sense the most significant um, 
uh, place where there's kind of that authority clash between the early church and um, the the Roman authorities is in Peter's speech, uh, Acts 10. And he describes Jesus as Lord. And that's very much a political statement. And what Peter's saying is that at the end of the day, this is our Lord. And so maybe that's the message to take away from that, is that in the world of Acts, you can work with the Romans, you can work with the Sanhedrin, but your first priority is the Lord. And, you know, hey, look, that's easy enough to say, but, you know, Stephen was martyred. Uh, and Paul, you know, Paul had people kicked out of their homes and their synagogues before his conversion. Uh, so, so, you know, it's one of those things that's easy for us to say now, 2,000 years later, but perhaps it was important just to read that. So just, you know, being aware of the way the power dynamics operates. Um, is it a theme? I don't know. Is it important for us to be aware of as we read it? I'm going to say yes, uh, because of that kind of the way that power dynamic operates and how it informs our background understanding. The final theme that I do think is important to, to recognize, we're going to be pretty quick tonight actually, uh, is the picture of success. Now, if you were to read Acts, you know, you just read it. Um, and, you know, the church is off to a cracking pace. Hundreds of people become followers in Jerusalem. Paul wanders around. He's setting up churches everywhere. It's just... Phew. You'd expect by the year 250, 300 that the entire Roman world would be Christian. But they're not. Uh, they, they, they're just not. And in fact... During the formation of the canon, and, and probably even by, almost by the time that Paul, that Acts is published, everyone's aware of that. And so, one of the themes is that although we see it, it's focused very much on the the work of the Spirit, it's focused on on how the Spirit brings conversion and brings people into the church. Uh, it also recalls. But not everything's a success. Um, so one of my favorite examples, actually, of uh, not quite as successful as you would think. Um, you know the story of Paul and, he, he, and uh, he goes to the Areopagus and there's a speech about, you know, you have, the, have a, um, uh, an altar to an unknown God and um, what, you, what you worship as unknown, I'm telling you, is known. And this is the God who made... It's a great speech. It was almost totally unsuccessful. Uh, you know, people go, oh, yeah, come on, come back tomorrow. You're really entertaining. Um, but there were very few converts. Uh, Acts seventeen thirty four says some of them joined him and became believers. And then it sort of lists two names and then it says, and others. Uh, and you get the feeling that you know, the others might be another two people. So we've got Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris. Um, and so it, we, we get the impression that Paul, Paul was a great, must have been a great preacher, but uh, not 100% successful. Um, and, and the other example, um, and uh, you know, this is Paul in, in one of his journeys, and he's traveling around. Um, and people, oh, yay, Paul, great preacher. Um, but then, and this is in Acts 14, uh, the Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and went over the crowd. So Paul's preaching, and then some other preachers who are non-Christian Jews um, come out and they basically preach, this guy's a heretic, you've got to get rid of him. He's bad news. Um, and so they stone Paul, and they drag him out of the city and think he's dead and a couple of the believers gather around him and uh, they pray for him and he's not dead, which is good. Um, uh, but yeah, it's important for us to remember that although uh, 
there is this strong sense of success in the book of Acts. But the book of Acts also recognizes that not every missionary act is a success. Uh, and so it perhaps in that sense is a deeply realistic picture of, uh, of, of what might be, of, of, of how the world might operate. So that's five themes in Acts that help us understand it or flesh it out as we're going through. I'm going to go in and see if I can uh, track down the comments and see if there are any comments that I need to respond to straight away. Uh, yeah, let's see how we go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, Reg said you got the notes. Excellent, I'm glad you did. Um, and, oh, David says, Jews who became Christians, were they ostracized in community in Lee? Or did a church flourish in Jerusalem? Um, so there was a church in Jerusalem uh, under Peter um, for, for quite a while. Uh, and, and so they, they were able to operate. But uh, there were also many accountings of them being removed from the synagogue. So you... So they might have been able to live in the city, uh, but they would have been ostracized quite significantly from a lot of the a lot of the, the, the faith life of the community, which would have been very important to them. So, uh, yeah, it, I mean, there are there are still traditions today where um, in Christianity where when a person converts to a different, even not even to a different religion, but to a different part of, say, Christianity, they're no longer welcome in the space of worship. Uh, and historically, this was converting to a whole different religion. So it's it would have been deeply impacting. And perhaps, you know, that's one of the ways of looking at this, is, is for the Book of Acts to have been the story of, you're not alone in this. There are, you know, to my Jew, you know, although primarily probably directed at, at um, uh, a Gentile audience, not exclusively, but primarily, but bringing in the Jews, you are not alone. You might feel like you've been, you're alone, but you're not because you've got all these Jewish brothers, these Gentile brothers and sisters uh, all over the place. And their journey's been tough too, but they're on the, on the road. So I hope that sort of responds to that question. And uh, the act being more meaningful than the outcome. Um, I think I was thinking about this a while ago. Um, and, and for me, the story of Paul in the Areopagus is, is kind of one of the places. And this, I'm not sure if this is exactly what you're referring to in that con there. Um, but in that moment, historically, that was a pretty unsuccessful missionary moment for Paul, you know, um, at our last men's breakfast, we had um, uh, a presentation on Billy Graham. And like, can you imagine Billy Graham came out to something and sort of four or five people turned up? Uh, that would have been quite a, a shocking moment. But I do think that that speech, and that this is the thing with scripture, is it preserves things for far longer than their immediate impact. And so that speech and that 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 uh, mysticism gives birth to a very significant uh, theological kind of movement, uh, which continues into Thomas Aquinas uh, and uh, and so Thomas spirituality and theology as God as the ground and source of being, and continues to have an impact on theologians like Tillich. Uh, and then, you know, so, so it has this deep and abiding impact. Um, but in the moment, maybe not. <laughs> uh, so, so, so yes, the act is deeply meaningful. Um, and the outcome, not what Paul was expecting or wanting, but in that sense, really important. 
I think that's it for questions. Um, I'm going to say thank you. Good night. I will pop this on YouTube and uh, it'll, it'll live on the website and on Facebook. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.